All spring and summer, we anticipate the reliable blooms we've grown to know and love throughout the seasons of our lives. We'll share some of our favorite old-fashioned flowering shrubs and have guidance on their care straight ahead on this edition of Great Gardening. We celebrate each year um, as we receive it. For good nutrition, we need a balance of colors. I like to can because I'm a gardener. We brought home an orchard for our community. This was just an overgrown area full of bramble. Welcome to Great Gardening. This week, the lush and lovely blooms of old-fashioned lilacs and rose bushes have our attention. And our experts are here to share some of their favorites from days gone by. Tom Casper is the president of the Duluth Garden Flower Society, and Bob Olin is a St. Louis County educator and horticulturist. And gentlemen, it's been really a treat to gather together the photos and the video for this program and see some of the beautiful flowers that you've grown and the pictures that, you, that you've shared. Well, we've had joy. We've had fun. <laughs> and seasons in the sun. Not yet. No season in the sun yet <laughs> this yet. year. No sun. We're waiting for the God sun. Yeah. You know what's so great about tonight's programs? We're featuring some of these varieties that are really so minimal maintenance and they're so beautiful mm -hmm. that just about anybody can grow these and uh, yeah. have fun with them, really. That's right. why I'm so successful with them. <laughs> <laughs> Not true, just but kidding. we'll we'll get to more on that later. We want to thank and welcome our phone volunteers. They are from the Duluth Garden Flower Society Hilltop Garden Club and they're anxious to take your questions. So please give them a call at 218-788-2844 or call them toll free 877-307 8762. You can also email your question to askgardening at wdse.org. Well, we mentioned that uh, some of the roses uh, are really hardy, easy to grow. We've uh, got an example of some old garden roses mm. that were grown here in Duluth by Kathy Algren. Here's some of the pictures from the tour that she shared with us a couple years ago, and really some fine examples of of the beautiful hardy shrub and, roses and you can grow we switch, in these areas. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we switch that, and we've talked about the scarecrow oh, as, yeah? as the mm -hmm. deer deterrent. We saw that in that picture. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. This red one, gorgeous. Oh, this is quadra. That one's so recognizable. That's one of the Canadian roses. Just absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, you know, so many. This looks like it's maybe John Davis, which is the... Uh, and again, one in the Explorer Canadian series. So we've got so many, and, and Kathy Algren's done such a nice job of putting together a collection of really hardy shrub roses that really are uh, minimally mates, uh, maintenance required. And in this case, I was just a little excited to see the bumblebees in there working. Yes. <laughs> so much discussion about uh, pollinators, That's and right. once again, you can have beauty in your yard, and you can actually improve the habitat for so many of these, uh, these essential bees and other pollinators. Yeah. So this the is The shrub roses really bring them in, don't they? Yes, they do. All right. Yeah, great pictures. And, and like Bob said, easy. most of them are easy to take care mm -hmm. of, minimal inputs uh, and maximum output with, with both the beautiful flowers Some and the Some have fragrance. been around for generations, others a little bit newer. Yeah, they've been doing uh, some breeding work, and again, the Canadians have done uh, so much excellent work uh, that we benefit from, because uh, believe it or not, we have a cold climate. It's something we're just south of Canada. <laughs> believe it or feels not. Like <laughs> Who doesn't believe it right now? <laughs> so, uh, so we love the work that they're doing, and their Ministry of Agriculture, uh, their pro breeding program has been exceptional. Mm -hmm. Well, those were just to uh, whet your appetite. We're going to suggest some more specific shrub rose varieties that you might want to try. But first, Here's a look at how to keep those plants flourishing well into the future. Well, this is a very popular shrub roses. This is William Booth, very, very hardy for our northern climates. It's a beautiful, easy to take care of rose, but as you can see, over time it gets a little out of control. This, if allowed to grow, will get about six feet by six feet and I really don't want it that big. Over the years, it's gotten to the point where it doesn't bloom as well. So what you can do, you can do this with a lot of shrubs, is you can go in and do a rejuvenating pruning. And it's basically just going down and cleaning this whole thing up. And you can leave four or five inches up if you want. You know, you kind of want to get similar height so the growth is similar in the spring. Early in the spring, you can see we still have snow um, a great time to do it. 
most shrub roses, if you do this about every five to seven years, will be good. Um, it's best to do it in the spring because most roses bloom on new wood. So it's going to send its flush of growth and still give us lots of flowers to enjoy this season. And it will probably get two and a half to three feet tall still this season. Because it was overgrown, you're probably going to see more blooms this year than I saw last year. So in a matter of a few minutes, we've gone from a unsightly and unruly shrub rose to a rose that's ready for, for growth this spring. William Booth has been around for probably 50, 60 years, but of course shrub roses for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years um, coming uh, from Europe originally. Rhododendrons and azaleas are a lot like lilacs. You can see that these buds were formed last year and these are the flower buds on this rhododendron. It's going to bloom a beautiful soft pink. Um, so we really don't want to go in and do any pruning now or we're going to be removing those buds and end up with an unsightly shrub unless you've gotten winter damage or things like that that you want to prune out. But in this case, we wouldn't want to do anything to it right now because we'd be taking off the flowers. So lilacs, because they're a spring bloomer, their buds were set last fall. So if you're going to prune them and you're concerned about first enjoying those flowers, it's best to prune it after they're done blooming. And those though, similarly, you can go in and take them right down to just a few inches from the ground. They're gonna explode with growth that first year after the pruning and come back, back very strong and give you lots of blooms for years to come after that. All right, great advice. And here's a look at the common lilac. And you guys pronounce that for me. A syringa vulgaris. Yeah, okay. And this is the one, you know, that we see everywhere in the area, the beautiful, beautiful violet, lilac colored, um, one of my favorites. I just love the scent. Had those at my wedding, and so, uh, you and, know, and, very and much if, appreciate if our the lilacs. Spring, yeah, if our spring shapes up, we're going to see those blooms in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, it won't be long. Yeah. Um, here's another one of your favorites, Tom, that you grow, the iris. Yep, lots of iris varieties. This, of course, is the bearded iris, been around for hundreds of years as mm -hmm. well. And lots of varieties of color and very easy to grow. Okay, and uh, one of the Asiatic lilies. Yeah, and this, this one's a peach pixie. Um, beautiful kind of coral peach color, um, also easy to grow. But like a lot of our other lilies, you're going to have to make sure that you do something to keep the deer away from them mm. if you have deer problems. Deer love those lilies. Yeah, uh, and of course on the right, stargazer, which is an oriental lily, um, very, very beautiful, big clusters of flowers, just outstanding. Um, and there and it is. <laughs> Could we have a moment, please? Uh, the Duluth. <laughs> dum, da, da, dum. The no, it's Duluth. a gorgeous peony. Yeah, just... and. And interestingly, this is one of the last peonies in the garden to bloom. So oh, Duluth okay. is, is a very late peony, like we are very late with our <laughs> springs here in Duluth. So How just long has that shrub been around? Uh, Duluth peony was introduced onto the market in 1931. Okay. So it's been around for 80 plus years. All so. right. Well, another lovely favorite. Yeah. Well, let's move on to some questions. We've already got uh, some called in. This one is... From Nancy, and I, you know, I think this is probably answered, but she says she has two roses wrapped in burlap uh, last fall, wondering about ha taking the burlap off, time to remove it yet, and uh, wondering about pruning it. And we saw an example of yeah. that, Tom, in your tip. Yeah, she'll want to get that burlap off now, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly now is a great time. She can take a look at it, see if there's any canes that have died back or any discoloration and prune to the bud, so... Okay, here's a question about strawberry plants. How soon can I get those in the ground? Oh, you can go right now. If you've got uh, strawberry plants, uh, as long as your garden bed is drained a little bit so we don't get a lot of compaction, uh, there's no problem with planting right at this time. Uh, another one about getting those seedlings uh, from my veggies out. When can I put them out? This is from Susan in Duluth. Okay, we've got to be really careful here. I would say anything that's frost sensitive, of course, we've got a little ways to go on that one mm -hmm. in particular. But mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, there are many others that really uh, could be planted now. The broccoli and the cabbage root, of course, would be one that could certainly be uh, planted at this time. Stay away from cauliflower, still a little too cool. But uh, frost sensitive material, we've got to wait until the first week in June. Okay. Now, this one from Nancy and Esco is, when do I remove the tree wrap? So I, I don't know if she's talking about the bark. 
Yeah, she's probably talking about the wrap on the bark of her mm -hmm. trees, and she can take that off now as well. Okay, so. all right. Um, here's one about corn. Now, this viewer says we grew corn last year, but we had earwigs in the cobs. Mm. What can we do to have good corn this year? And now, earwigs are a recent problem and phenomenon that we're beginning to see. Uh, shouldn't be a major problem, actually. There's corn earworm that we see every year. Um, we don't have good non-chemical controls for earwig, uh, but again, it should not be a major problem uh, two years in a row, but uh, who knows what's coming as things warm up a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, um, and Bob had mentioned that they're a recent phenomena here in Duluth, probably in the last decade or so, okay. people are dealing with them, and, and they are kind of quietly not getting credit for all the damage that they're doing in people's oh. gardens because they're nocturnal. People don't see them, um, but they are doing a, a significant amount of damage to both our perennial stock and our annual stock. Vegetables, uh, they're destroying uh, ripening tomatoes, all sorts of things that they're getting into. So it is a big problem, and uh, as Bob mentioned, there isn't or aren't a lot of organic controls, but I've seen where folks are using a product called diatomaceous earth, which is okay. crustaceans that have been crushed and, and you sprinkle it as a powder, and mm -hmm. the, as the earwig actually crawls through that, it uh, hurts Chops them. it up. It chops them up. <laughs> yeah. Tom, when we first found them, again, the fact they were nocturnal, we get, a, get up before the sun rises to find them, but you'll see the damage in the morning. And there are some synthetic pyrethroids, which are, are a derivative of the chrysanthemum that can be used in our label for the garden if you have to go that route. Yeah. Okay, um, here's a question from Linda and David Spears. Will ornamental rhubarb grow from seeds saved from last season? Certainly will, there's no problem there, except they'll find that it does take quite a while. That's why we're constantly dividing rhubarb. They should be much better off if she could divide the plant up. It's gonna go a lot faster than if she tries to germinate the seed. Okay, um, from Marcy in Duluth, they have uh, forsythia, spirea, that have been eaten by voles and mice. What should I do? Can I trim or prune those? Yeah, um, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of that kind of damage this year because of the, the snow cover that we had and, and that activity that they continued to have throughout the winter. Um, go in, cut them right down to the ground or within a couple of inches of the ground, maybe leave two to four inches of the plant above. They're gonna sprout back for you. Obviously, the forsythia won't bloom this year mm -hmm. because the, the buds are were set last year, but in future years, they should be good. But the so. spirea will bloom this yep. year? Okay. It blooms on both new and old wood, so. Okay, all right, great. Well, yeah, lots of people seeing winter damage and time to get out there and, and clean it up, definitely. Yeah. Well, for this week's tour, we return to a Duluth yard with some really fine examples of shrubs in the full blush of bloom. Good morning, happy to see you. Welcome to our garden. This is um, a Woodland Avenue garden that was moved from another location, including all of the rocks and a lot of the plants. So this is really the cornerstone of the whole backyard, and including this piazza that I built two years ago. And we've tried to achieve a garden that has a lot of um, nice gradients, a lot of nice, nice textures, a lot of nice contrast. And I think it was inspired by a lot of the Japanese style gardens that we saw when we lived in Oregon. Um, we can't grow everything that's grown there, but we have some interesting um, conifers and dwarf conifers and um, there's a lot of different textures just from the leaves and the and the needles of the conifers so I'd call it a foliage garden with just a few flowers for accent. Yeah we do have a few rhododendrons um, we've got the Min University of Minnesota introductions of the, all of the northern lights or most of the northern lights the azaleas switch all spring long. You can see that there are some that have already spent their blossoms, but each week there's a new one to look at. The ajuga that's below it comes up every year, so we have the blue color and 
we like blue. But also the, the new vegetation when it comes out is extraordinarily bright on some of the yellow barberries. Um, just about any of the leaves when they come out um, are, are pretty bright. So it, yeah, there's quite a flush of um, new growth and color. But also things that stay gray-blue um, pretty much the year round, like the dianthus and the sedum and, and a few of the miniature hostas. So it's, it's all about contrast, really. It's a, it's a dwarf Japanese maple. It, we won't ever let it get um, any taller than it is. This particular one, we cover it every winter because we're not sure it's if it can survive or not. Yeah, zone five. And when you look around, you'll see smaller versions and larger versions of the same thing. You'll see tiny hostas and you'll see giant hostas and you'll see tiny dianthus and then big dianthus. So it's a combination and it's fun to put them in front of each other and see how they go together. We like to call this a ceremonial entrance to the garden, but in fact, it's usually not used. I started um, putting copper together, soldering it. Um, I've got some twisted um, copper wire in there. There's, of course, the hardware cloth is to keep out the rabbits. That wasn't part of the original design, but they'll hop through a very small um, area. And then it turns a nice kind of um, well, green and it, it, it's all tarnished looking. It, we feel as though the garden is maturing. You know, there are trees that'll get bigger, obviously, but I think we're about 95% where we want to be with, with everything that's planted. And it's a good thing because um, we're aging and the work has been hard and we might not be able to keep this up for too many more years. I spent my, time, my life being an administrator and now I'm retired and I can do some of the things I truly love. Um, it's really been fun. Uh, those were some beautiful shrubs, the azaleas and rhododendrons. But now on to some of the shrub roses that we think you might enjoy for their beauty and durability. And first up is the Frontenac. Yeah, these are some of our favorites, and they're all very, very hardy and grow very, very well in the series. Frontenac is in the Explorer series. The Canadians developed two big series, or maybe more than two, but they started really uh, with the Explorer series that was from eastern Ontario. But nonetheless, they're extremely good. John's Monk is another one in that Explorer series that's very, very nice and hardy for us in this area. Lots and, of beautiful petals on oh, those. Fantastic. And, and this Morden blush too. Look at how, how full that is. Now we moved from Eastern Canada to Western Canada. This is actually in Manitoba, the Morden Experiment Station, Morden blush. There's a whole Morden series and blush is one of those fantastic ones, uh, kind of a pinkish hue to it. Beautiful, beautiful, hardy, hardy rose. And then John Davis, we're back in the Explorer series. These, this is really one of my favorites, and I think you'd agree, Tom. Fantastic. Yeah. And these do bloom instead of once. They bloom on both new and some old wood. So consequently, uh, we get more of a continuous bloom through the season. They're very, very prolific. William Baffin, again, there were an awful lot of those Canadian explorers out there. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you get a little Canadian history in the process of uh, planting shrub roses in your backyard. But William Baffin's another real beauty. And this is... The what a fine example of it that. and how, how tall that William Baffin grows. Yeah, they can, they can grow six, eight feet and, and fill in an area and, uh, and look, at the, look at the beautiful blue This is our now. program director, Julie Kellner, who grew this in her yard and it's yeah. just fabulous. William Baffin is really the, the only true hardy climbing rose or, or acts like a climbing rose in our environment. So that's, if folks are looking for something to, to adorn a trellis or an arbor, uh, William Baffin is a great That's hardy the choice. One, yeah. For sure. And okay. so many of these are really zone two, zone three, so mm -hmm. we don't have the hardiness issues. And you prune them up just as you demonstrated in your tip a little bit earlier. And, and if you really want to get aggressive, you can renovate them by cutting them back real hard. So they're, they're just, uh, they will be in your landscape for a long, long time, and they're minimal maintenance. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much for sh sharing some of those. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll all get a chance to try them if we don't already have them in our garden. Let's get back to some questions from viewers. Lori in Cloquet has a hydrangea. Uh, the branches are broken. Can I trim them at the break on the branch and will the plant be okay? Uh, yes and yet more than likely yes. Uh, okay. But you'll want to go ahead and clean it up. Now is a great time to do that. Get all the broken branches out. And that's really a good time for us and all of our shrubs right now is to be out and getting those cleaned up and getting them ready for 
what's going to be a great year. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but what about this? This is a lilac. It's five years old and hasn't flowered. Can I transplant it now to a sunnier location? Would this be a good time? Perfect. Yep. Okay. If it's sun. And she's right, oftentimes uh, we're not getting quality growth. Sometimes they can be young, though, and it takes a while to really get established. But if she uh, is lacking sun, then move it to a sunny location right now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Alona in Hermantown has an iris that is, well, this is five inches tall and blooms. She wants the iris to grow taller. Well, more than likely, it's a, it's a shorter variety because they're, mm. they, like many of our other plants, that size is, is predetermined. So she can't really take what's our miniature irises and get them to grow taller. So she's going to need to go out and find varieties that get taller and enjoy those shorter ones while she's doing it. And there are dozens and dozens of varieties oh, of yeah. irises. Um, we've shared some of those. If you want to get a look at uh, Duluth City Hall and the Civic Center, those should be coming up fairly well. When do those come up? In another yeah, yeah they're, they're few three weeks, weeks through yeah. right now. Yeah. actually, the, uh, the foliage is at least. Yeah. There's yeah. a nice variety there to take a look at. Okay, um, Naomi in Duluth has a 17-year-old flowering crab tree that got root fungus last year. What do I do with it? Hmm. I wish I had a little bit better explanation what she means by root fungus. Mm. Uh, obviously, if she's seeing deterioration in the upper portion of the plant, you want to let it bud out. And we usually don't have uh, fungi that kills these, particularly a 17-year-old tree. So it could be just a function of the season. I would stay with it. And if she still has a problem, then we could recommend some protectant uh, fungicides, uh, maybe for next season. But just go with it for now. Okay. Rod has a shrub rose that's covered with round brown balls. What could they be? Those are probably either rose or the hips mm -hmm. from the blossoms, which you can cut off uh, very easily, or it could be a mite that uh, creates oh. a little bit of a pocket as a protectant and overwinters in that. So he'll want to cut down maybe three or four inches below those balls. So it's either rose hips from the blossoms or a mite that's burrowed into the cane. Either one, not a problem. Now tell us again what, if you, if you want to keep the rose hips on, is there anything you need to do? Nope. Okay. Uh, just let them bloom and not cut the, the flowers <laughs> right. off and they mm -hmm. will most, most times form. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I'm not sure the name here, but, um, oh, I'm sorry, I can't read that one, so I'm going to have to come back to that. But a uh, web question from Dan who has dry root strawberry and raspberry plants in cold storage. How long can they be stored before planting? Ooh, there's a good question. Mm -hmm. Keep them cool, a little bit moist, and uh, certainly they can go in uh, well into uh, mid-June. The sooner you get them in, the better they're going to do because this is really the establishment year for both of those. So the sooner the better. They could go right now, but he can go certainly uh, well into June if he needs to. All right. Well, now we have a look at some shrubs with unique characteristics that were recommended by an area viewer. Here's this week's Grow and Show. Mike Heim of the Hayward, Wisconsin area is keen on broad-leaved evergreen shrubs because they thrive on the acidic sandy soils of that local region. And he says, grow with little effort. Mike suggests gardeners try one out, like maybe this Pieris floribunda, or one of the mountain laurels he grows in various shades of pink and red. This spring heath, boasting ruby red flowers and needle-like foliage, makes an attractive grass.